Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Thank you very much, Adam, for that kind of introduction. All of us were shocked and saddened by the mass shooting, uh, deaths of farm workers in San Mateo County. Maybe it was especially horrific because it happened in your own backyard. That brutality also exposed horrific living and working conditions, as well as credible claims of serious labor violations. But it was hardly an aberration in the long and sordid history of farm worker exploitation and oppression in this state and our nation. On the 28th of, 28th of January, it was 75 years since the plane wreck at the Los Gatos Canyon in 1948. A DC-3 airliner with 32 people got fire and crashed into Los Gatos Canyon in western Fresno County. The dead included 28 Bracero farm workers being deported. The Anglo pilots, flight attendant, and immigration officer were identified. But most of them, oh, most of the farm workers were just listed as deportees. The deportees remains were buried in unnamed graves by the Latino uh, community and the Catholic Diocese of Fresno. Songwriter Woody Guthrie heard of the tragedy on the radio. The announcer reportedly said they were just deportees. He was incensed and wrote a beautiful tribute, Deportee or Plain Rake to Los Gatos, later sung by Bob Dylan and John Baez, among many others. The refrain goes, Goodbye to my Juan, goodbye Rosalita, Adios, mis amigos, Jesus y Maria. You won't have your names when you ride the big airplane. All they will call you will be deportees. A professor, Tim Hernandez, recently researched the deportees, found their names, and funded a memorial gravestone at the cemetery. The deportees finally got their names back. Almost 60 years ago, on September 17, 1963, a freight train collided with a farm labor bus outside the small farming town of Chular in the Salinas Valley. 32 Bracero farm workers died. Before a similar audience at the Commonwealth Club in 1984, Cesar Chavez opened his remarks by recounting that crash. He said, most of the bodies laid unidentified for days. No one, no one, including the grower who employed the workers, even knew their names. 49 years ago, on January 14, 1974, 19 letters workers died from the farm labor bus careened off the road into a drainage ditch near Blythe, California. Approaching Blythe before sunrise, the bus missed a turn. Seats and farm workers were thrown in front of the bus. Most workers died from drowning in the shallow ditch while trapped by the wreckage. 24 years ago, on February 11, 1999, 13 tomato workers died when a farm laborer van crashed into a tractor trailer in the pre-dawn darkness of uh, West Fresno County. Instead of seats bolted to the floor, the workers sat on a wooden bench with no seat belts. Upon impact, unsecured sharp tools flew at the workers. Some of them were speared. Five years ago, early in the morning of March 13, 2018, farm workers Santos Hilario Garcia and Maricela Garcia Perfecto, husband and wife, just dropped off their daughter at school in Delano and were heading to find work. They were undocumented. 
Santos, who was driving, saw lights flashing in the rearview mirror. He thought it was the police, so he stopped. When he realized they were ICE agents, agents the couple, fearing separation from loved ones, panicked and took off, fleeing at high speed with two ICE vehicles in hot pursuit. Santos lost control of, his, of the car, hit a utility pole, and flipped over. Both husband and wife died, leaving six orphan kids, ages 8 to 18. Tragedies such as these regularly befall farm workers. They usually go unnoticed. Yet, since the deaths of Half Moon Bay, some people are asking why we keep seeing these injustices. What is the cause? In his eulogy before the families of the dead lettuce workers in 1974 in Calexico, Cesar Chavez asked if these tra tragedies are deliberate. They are deliberate, he answered, in the sense that they are the direct result of, of a farm labor system that treats workers like agricultural implements and not as human beings. They are important because of the, the love they give to their husbands, their children, their wives, their parents, all of those, all of those were who are close to them and who need them. They are important of the work because of the work that they do. They're not implements to be used and discarded. They're human beings who sweat and sacrifice to bring food to the tables of millions of people throughout the world. As we weigh the historical and contemporary plight of farm workers, we can see that the San Mateo County shootings two months ago were not an exemption, a exemption. Rather, they were the direct result of fundamental injustice and indignity built into the system of farm labor in this state and nation, dating back more than a century and a half. Agriculture is still one of the richest industries in California. Cash receipts for all crops surpassed $51 billion in 2021. For more than a century and a half, the profits of California agriculture have been built uh, on the backs of generation after generation of exploited and oppressed farm workers. Often dark-skinned dark immigrants imported to work in our fields. Since the, since the 19th century, California fields have been worked by Chinese, Japanese, Mexican, Filipino, African Americans, the Oakleys and Arkis, Mexicans again, later Yemeni and Punjabi workers. When farm workers rob, rose up in protest, Growers broke their strikes by pitting one race against another, using Mexicans to break strikes by, Filipino, by Filipinos and vice versa. Growers marshaled all the social, economic, political, and legal institutions in rural California to crush organizing. Every strike was brutally broken. Every union was defeated. Strikers and orga organizers were beaten, blacklisted, deported, shot, killed. W growers were so powerful that when nearly all other American workers won the right to organize into unions to be paid a minimum wage and over time under the New Deal in, in, in the 30s, farm and domestic workers were and remained excluded. Segregationist lawmakers demanded FDR exclude farm workers because in the South, they were largely African Americans. It was pure racism. As one South lawmaker put it, you cannot put the Negro and the white men in the same basis. That racist exclusion from the right to organize and be paid over time continues to this day in most of the United States, except California, where the UFW ended the exclusion through legislation. Farm workers' exclusion from collective bargaining ended in California in 1975, when Cesar Chavez and the UFW 
with the help from millions of boycotting consumers, pushed through the Agricultural Labor Relations Act. The UFW didn't end farm workers' exclusion from overtime pay in California after eight hours a day until 2016. We recently also won over time in Oregon and Washington State. In the UFW, we have an expression. The laws on the books are not the laws in the fields. When horror stories emerge about farm workers' abuse, <coughs> such as after the San Mateo sh uh, County shootings, the industry rightly over, uh, observes that California has the toughest laws and rules in the nation protect protecting farm workers. But too often, enforcement of those laws falls far short of what it is promised in statute and regulation. Take the tragedy of Maria Isabel Jimenez Vasquez. May 14, 2008 was a hot day. Maria Isabel, only 17, had just arrived from Oaxaca, Mexico to earn money to send home. She had been working nine hours. There was no shade. There was no training for foremen or workers on what to do if someone got ill from the heat. All these protections and more were demanded by the state of California since 2005. Back then, the United Farm Workers convinced Repo Republican Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger to issue the first state regulations in the country to prevent death and illness from extreme heat. This was after a series of farm worker uh, heat deaths. At 3.40 p.m., Maria Isabel fell dizzy and unsteady. She didn't recognize Florentino, her 19-year-old fiancé. She passed out in his arms. The foreman stood over them, glaring. Maria Isabel was placed unconscious in a nearby van with no air conditioning. It was hotter inside the van. Maria Isabel waited for the workers to finish as they relied on the same vehicle. The driver decided that she needed medical care. On the way to the clinic, the foreman called the fiancé and said, If you take her to the clinic, the foreman said, don't say she was working for us. Say she became sick because she was jogging to get exercise. Since she's under age, it will create a big problem for us. They got to the clinic at 5.15 p.m., more than an hour and a half after Maria Isabel was stricken. An ambulance took her to the hospital. Her temperature was 108.4 degrees, far beyond what the human body can take. Maria Isabel's heart stopped six times in two days. Doctors revived her. On the third day, her good heart stopped for the last time, and efforts to revive her failed. The doctors learned she was pregnant. She probably never knew she would have been a mother. Doctors said if emergency medical help had been summoned or she had gone to the hospital sooner, Maria Saville might have survived. She was buried in her wedding dress. Countless workers' lives have been saved and, il and, and illnesses prevented because of those heat standards the UFW helped win. Today, decades after California became the first state to uh, grant farm workers unionization rights, workers still face daunting challenges in unionizing from growers who sternly resist the right to organize and have a union growers flaunt with impunity the law's protection. One of the most recent cases before the Agricultural Labor Relations Board is insightful. At Premier Raspberry Farm, with about 500 workers in Watsonville, the farm, work, the farm workers did everything right. They organized. They went on strike. They voted for the UFW in an election held during the strike. They asked to bargain for a union contract. The company refused to bargain at all. It refused to participate in the state's mandatory mediation process. Under it, 
Workers can bring in neutral state mediators to hammer out contracts when growers won't, nego won't negotiate them. Premier challenged the constitutionality of the mandatory mediation law, even as it was being upheld by the California Supreme Court. Three years after workers began organizing, Premier exhausted all its legal remedies. Within 10 days, according to the State Farm Labor Board, Premier suspiciously shut down operations. The company never intended to abide by the election results or the state-ordered union contract. The workers received only a modest financial settlement, a small fraction of what Premier would have paid in wages and benefits had the company complied with the law. The horrific conditions revealed by the mass shooting in Half Moon Bay are yet another reminder of why unionization remains so necessary. Squalid and deplorable living conditions were reported in the press after the murders. We understand Cal OSHA, the State Labor Commissioner's Office, and San Mateo County officials are investigating allegations of wage theft, other labor violations, and housing violations at the two farms. Now, contrast two Half Moon Bay mushroom farms with a unionized Monterey Mushroom Farm just down Highway 1 in Watsonville and in Morgan Hills. Monterey Mushroom, one of the largest fresh mushroom producers in America, employs about a thousand workers who have been working under UFW contract for years. The average unionized mushroom picker earns $45,000 a year with full family medical, dental, and vision coverage, paid holidays, and vacations, a defined benefit pension plan, job security, dignity and fairness on the job, and much more. Farm labor does not have to be this dead-end, low-wage, no-benefit occupation. We have shown the difference the union can make. California took a historic step forward last year with the signing of AB 2183. The right to vote in America was enshrined in law with the passage of the 1965 Voting Rights Act. So too in California, the right of farm workers to vote in union elections has been enshrined in law since the passing of the historic 1975 Farm Labor Act. Yet, when field workers try voting in a union, they are still stuck back in 1975, when just about only, the only way political voters could vote was at, at said uh, polling places. Under the 1975 farm labor law, agricultural workers can only vote at voting, voting places, nearly always set on growers' property. There, they must gauntlet of threats, they run a gauntlet of threats and intimidation and deportation by employer foremen, supervisors, and labor contractors. To preserve the status quo, growers argue they only want to help farm workers be per, uh, preserving the, uh, by preserving the right to vote in secret ballot elections held nearly exclusively, exclusively on grower property. That's like making a progressive voters of color only vote at MAGA headquarters. <laughs> the opinion editor of the McClatchy newspaper chain in California skewered these industry claims by noting, that is how absolute power over the powerless works. You deny them their rights while pretending you are doing them a favor. So over a, a two-year period, the United Farm Workers took up in California the same fight underway across the nation to protect voting rights. During the marathon campaign, farm workers gave up days of pay to lobby and protest. They spent time away from families. Last year, workers undertook a grueling 24-day, 335-mile pilgrimage, or march, up the Central Valley to state capital in the triple-digit heat summer. 
they endured genuine physical hardship. I know because I walked every step of the way with them and I'm no spring chicken anymore. <laughs> Nearly 7,000 uh, farm workers and supporters joined us for the final distance to the capital in Sacramento last August. After the three week march, workers and supporters held a mo uh, month of vigils at the Capitol and across the state, urging the governor to sign their bill. More broad public support was mobilized for fa by farm workers last year that, than at any time in decades. All those sacrifices by field workers and supporters convinced lawmakers to pass and Governor Newsom to sign a UFW-sponsored bill with 50 legislative co-authors, a measure updating the 1975 Farm Labor Law. It gives farm workers the right to vote for the comfort of, and security of their own homes, free from threats and intimidation and deportation. The UFW is now gearing up for new farm worker organizing and elections later this year. This law is not a silver bullet. The desperate poverty of many farm workers, their lack of immigration status, and most recently, the loss of so much work and wages from California, rains and floods, all mean many workers still would rather keep their heads down and work today, and even in brutal conditions, than risk fighting back. But for the first time in decades, farm workers who chose to stand up for their rights will at least be in a fair fight without the union election process rigged against them. The UFW has in recent years achieved much progress for farm workers, even as we know so much more work remains undone. The UFW is helping pull the wages of many agricultural workers in some California's largest farm, uh, farming regions up above the minimum wage. Last year, for the first time, California farm workers fully benefited from overtime. Farm worker pay has also risen from many negotiated and renegotiated UFW contracts. They cover vegetable, berry, wine grape, tomato, dairy, date, feedlot, and citrus, workers in, the, in, in three states. Most of California's mushroom industry is unionized. Another renegotiated UFW contract with one of the uh, nation's biggest vegetable producers provides pay and benefits increases for 1,500 workers. The employer pays 100% of the $700 per month cost of complete family, medical, dental, and vision coverage. The average unionized fresh tomato picker in California earns about $38 an hour, the highest paid tomato workers in America. Unionized farm workers are still a small percentage of overall workforce. But when the union is active in the area, non-union growers are compelled to treat and pay people better. Our very existence improves conditions. In 2019, the UFW sponsored bills to ban chlorpyrifos in California agriculture. This is the toxic chemical damaging the brains and lowering the IQ of infants and young children. Moving our bills through the state capitol convinced Governor Newsom to eliminate use of chlorpyrifos the, uh, that year through executive action. With at least half of U.S. farm workers undocumented, according to the U.S. Labor Department, the biggest uh, concern voiced by many of them today is their immigration status. It makes them so vulnerable to being abused and mistreated. So the UFW has become a leader in the national fight for immigration reform. With our allies, we negotiated with national growers group, grower groups and lawmakers from both parties to craft compromise bipartisan agricultural immigration reform. It would let immigrant farm workers earn permanent legal status 
and a pathway to citizenship by continuing to work in agriculture. That measure passed the U.S. House with 30 Republican votes, the most bipartisan support for any recent immigration bill. President Biden embraces it. But the proposal stalled in the Senate, like much other vital legislation, because of the filibuster. Republicans hold over the House makes progress in the near future extremely hard, but we remain ready to work with anyone to achieve this vital priority. Cesar Chavez regularly talk about the movement's achievements, but one of the places he chose to, to be reflective was during his address to the Commonwealth Club in November 9, 1984. Shirley Temple Black, then president of the club, invited Caesar, but he was initially cautious. She was a Nixon Republican. So Caesar asked his aide and speechwriter, Mark Grossman, who is with us tonight, to check it out. Miss Black quickly returned his call, explaining she was a big fan. She had kept her membership in the Screen Actors Guild after her child acting days had ended to support other actors. Years later, when she needed major surgery, Mrs. Black finally was paid for because of the union membership. Caesar's address to the Commonwealth Club is now in anthologies of speeches by great Americans. It was the first time he read from a text, thinking that's what politicians do. Mark convinced him and convinced me <laughs> Some speeches are so important that every word matters. During the luncheon forum before a crowd of hundreds at the big hotel in the financial district, Mrs. Black and Cesar had lunch together on the dais. They got along like old friends, sharing interest in gardening and vegetarianism. In his remarks, he discussed traveling for years across North America while championing the farm workers. He met countless people, especially Latinos, but people from all walks of life who would tell him how the farm workers inspired them to be the first in their family to go to college, to become professionals or business person, to run for public office. He had a resounding message for all of us in that speech. Caesar said, once social change begins, it cannot be reversed. You cannot uneducate the person who has learned to read. You cannot humiliate the person who feels pride. You cannot oppress the people who are not afraid anymore. We all stand on the shoulders of those who came before us. My predecessors were born in the United States. I was born and raised in Mexico. The granddaughter of a Zapotec woman whose indigenous roots go back before the Spanish conquest. I first came to this country in my 20s, seeking like millions of immigrants to make a better life. My understanding of the farm workers' struggle, he, struggles hails from the fact that when I came to America, I did not speak English. I would only watch English television, no Spanish. I wanted to learn English so badly, every day I strived to master five to seven sentences, constantly repeating them all day. Watching TV, I heard the word enjoy, but had the hardest time figuring out what it meant. Finally, after struggling, I learned its meaning, and when I did, I really enjoyed it. I appreciate what it means to come to a new country, to be exposed to a new language, a new culture, new people, and to learn to adapt to it all. So I have come to equally be proud of my Mexican and Zapotecan heritage and my US, U.S. citizenship. My immigrant background is why I can uniquely relate to a farm labor workforce that is now overwhelmingly immigrant largely undocumented and heavily made up of women. I'm also proud that the majority of the elected U.S. Executive Board are women. 
My work with the UFW is personal, from being a Latina and being an immigrant. Not long ago, I fasted five days in Seattle over retaliation against dairy workers who complained about grievances such as wage theft. During the fast, I led a delegation to a Seattle headquarters of a big corporation buying from these dairies. We rhetorically pushed back against security guards trying to block us from talking to anyone. Finally, a company official came down to meet with us in the lobby of a big skyscraper. There is nothing I can do, this man exclaimed. He said we should send them our grievances in writing. We can't take sides, he added. We're not asking you to take sides, I replied. We're asking you to get the dairies to meet with us. He still resisted. Then one of the immigrant dairy workers, a woman named Josefina Luciano, stepped forward. She had been kicked in the face by a cow. Ele Eleven of her teeth were knocked out. She nearly died. For a long time, she could not even kiss her three young children. If you won't listen to me, then at least look at me, Josefina demanded in Spanish as I translated. She opened wide her disfigured mouth. I was kicked by a cow. I was in a pool of my own blood, and no one ever knew, even knew how to call the ambulance. Later, my employer falsely claimed I was not a full-time worker, and I lost my worker compensation benefits. This company man soon had tears in his eyes. There are other workers who want to share their stories, I told them, and offered to translate. No, I'm from Puerto Rico, he said. I speak Spanish. Another female dairy worker spoke about how she was sexually harassed in front of her husband. A male dairy worker said he wished he was treated as well as the cows he tends. I have passion within me to help Josefina Luciano and other immigrant workers change their lives. That's what I do, what I do. When he was with you, Caesar said he wanted change to come for farm workers, not because of charity or idealism, but because it's the right and decent and humane thing to do for the men, women, and children who feed us all. That mis mis mission remains unchanged. That is the cause to which we in the United Farm Workers remain committed today. Thank you very much, and si se puede. Thank you very much, Teresa. <clears throat> and uh, as Adam noted, uh, my name is Irene Debaricua. I am Director of Operations and Communications for an organization called Líderes Campesinas. Uh, Líderes Campesinas is a statewide network of women farm worker leaders and uh, allies, of course, of the UFW. And so it's a, an honor to, to be here today and, and have this plática, um, ask some questions. And of thank course. you so much for, for your powerful words and, and also for your work, right? Not just as president of the UFW, but for managing much of the, of the work beforehand for, for several years. Um, so it's an honor again. And Irene marched with us when we marched in August. <laughs> I did. <laughs> I marched. I, yes, eight, yes. I put in my 18 miles. <laughs> and and uh, very present at the vigil as well. So it's great work. Uh, so you touched on many of the, the issues that some questions uh, that arose um, beforehand. Uh, but let's start with uh, what you spoke on the Half, May, Half Moon Bay shooting. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, wildfires, floods, and the recent shooting in Half Moon Bay have all brought to light many of the inequities that farm workers have been experiencing. These range from lack of health care, mental health, poor living and working conditions, and poverty wages, as you know and noted. Although much progress has been made in California thanks to the work and lead of the UFW, many of the same issues brought up in Cesar Chavez's Commonwealth Address in 1984 continue to be relevant today. 
we would like to hear from you a little bit more on a few of those issues, one of them being wages. The fight for higher wages and benefits have always been a part of la lucha, the struggle, and being unionized is key in many industries. The overtime law passed successfully, as you mentioned. However, many farm workers are um, finding that their employers will do anything to avoid paying them overtime, such as cutting their days and it, making anything, making it impossible for them to work those extra hours. Is there any plans to, to try and change that? You know, like I said in my, my comments, um, the laws in the books are not the laws in the fields. Farm workers are entitled to overtime pay. And the employers um, use that to anger the, the workers against the UFW because there's NC because of the UFW, now you cannot work more hours. Unfortunately, the, the, the workers are coming to us to let us know that the, the employers get them to pay f to work 40 hours and get them paid. And instead of paying them overtime, is um, they make them work more hours, pay them in cash, but not the overtime. The only way is for farm workers to understand their rights. Why is it that is in this industry, we are okay with employers not following the law? When any other industry, any other business, small businesses, if they have to pay over time, they do it. We need mm -hmm. to make sure and, and understand that these growers are breaking the law and we need to understand that farm workers in many cases are afraid to speak up. Thank you. Very true. And I did forget to mention that with online viewers, um, there will be a chance for some questions and they could just be written in the chat. So just want to make sure to say that. And uh, thank you, Teresa. So in regards to uh, housing, everyone throughout the nation saw the conditions that farm workers were living in. Can you tell us a little bit of what the UFW has been doing and, and how can we encourage more oversight or demand more oversight of the conditions of the housing? You know, I, I have talked to many people and they come to me and tell me, you know, but now we're, we're um, finding them. We are giving them cash, uh, financial penalties. And that doesn't help the workers. The workers already went through horrible working conditions and living conditions. Um, it affects many workers. It affects those who are undo undocumented and afraid to speak. It affects those workers who come with a uh, H-2A visa, which is a temporary visa. Mm -hmm. Those workers are 100% under the control of the employer because they live in the premises. They transport them to work, from work, into the store. So when a worker has some issues, they don't even know who to talk to. The important thing is we're not going to be able, the UFW is not going to be able to do the work. We all need to do the work at every level. Mm -hmm. Farm workers who sometimes don't know their rights, us who are buying, who are the consumers, and we can go to the stores and say, who sells? Who, who are you buying mm -hmm. from? How are your workers being treated? It, it takes a village. I truly believe it takes a village, and it's going to take all of our efforts to be able to make a difference. Definitely. Great. In regards to health care, I had some questions, and I know the UFW was also a, a contributor to the UC Merced Farm Worker Health Study that the, uh, was just released. Um, this brought attention, uh, many issues and conditions that we are already aware of as well. Um, particularly in the areas of working conditions, housing, food insecurity, and civic participation. The study attempts to assess the current health of farm workers by focusing on the experiences with COVID-19, physical health, mental health, women, and reproductive health. More than half of farm workers in California are without health insurance and continue to work with undiagnosed illnesses, whether it be valley fever, asthma, and other physical um, ailments. And uh, as we pursue a more inclusive and affordable health care system, can you share what role the UFW has had in ensuring a better pathway to health care services? You know, you cover a lot of things there, but mm -hmm. just think about it. In, in California, farm workers were deemed essential. Well, not in the mm -hmm. country, not only in California, but they were never treated as essential workers. Mm -hmm. They were not provided masks. They were not informed of the symptoms of, of, of COVID. 
Um, and and we react to that by saying, what are we going to do? But And we provided masks, we provided information. However, as long as we have workers who are undocumented, who work seasonally, who work five, six months a year to support a family, they're not going to make a priority their health. Their priority is how are they going to support their family here and in their countries of origin. So in order to get to that point, in order to get to a point where farm workers are going to feel free to ask and to go to a doctor, they're going to have to make earned a decent living. They're going to have to know that if they go to a doctor, nobody is going to deport them. Nobody is going to share that information. Even to when they wanted to get vaccinated, mm -hmm. they were afraid to call any clinic because they were afraid to give their information until we yeah. started doing clinics, you know, with the farm worker. But it's fear a lot of the times that motivates workers to do or don't do the things that they that are good for them. Definitely. So uh, that brings me to uh, what really the, I guess the, <laughs> the overall cause, right, of many of these issues is the immigration status of many workers. Uh, many of the abuses and savage conditions, as Cesar Chavez referred to them in his speech, are due to the fact that they live in the shadows as a result of their incomplete or non-existent citizenship status. The UFW has been working for years to address immigration policies and a pathway to citizenship. Can you tell us, I know you did mention right now about the, the Farm Worker Modernization Act. Um, can you tell us about some of the progress that has been made and current key policies being pursued and and how can the public contribute and help? You know, I, I don't think sometimes many consumers, I really understand the importance of this workforce. If you think about it during the pandemic where we would go to the store and we couldn't find toilet paper, we panicked. Everybody was panicking. What are we going to do? Just imagine that you, go to the, you would have gone to the store and you don't find the food that you need to feed your family. So it, 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 it is... When you talk about immigration, unfortunately, it's a very partisan um, issue. Mm -hmm. And for the first time, like I said, we were able to get uh, 30 Republicans to support the Farm, Work for, Farm Workforce Modernization Act. We also have learned in the movement that it takes many tries and it takes years to be able to accomplish the things that we want to accomplish for farm workers. And immigration is one of them. People, uh, politicians play with the lives of these men and women who are sitting there who would love to go and see their family members, yeah. but they can't. So the next two years, as long as we have a Republican majority in Congress, we see it very difficult that we're going to move any bill. But this is an opportunity for us to be able to really President Biden would sign it if he got to his desk. Mm -hmm. So it is an opportunity for us to really work on areas and states and, and or where we want to change who is representing us. With this work, Without this workforce, we don't have food security in this country. We don't have food in our tables. We, don't ha we have food that would come, God knows, from somewhere else. We're going to keep fighting, mm -hmm. but it's going to take, um, like I said, these next two years, it's, it's going to be very difficult. Okay. Well, we're here to fight with you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we have a question here about um, unemployment hazard pay. We have seen farm workers working in extremely hazardous conditions, and we recognize that the UFW has helped California lead the nation by implementing heat and pesticide protections, among others. Still, farm workers are often seen working in hazardous conditions, and others are left without work in unforeseen uh, circumstances such as the natural disasters. Mm -hmm. uh, most do not qualify for unemployment benefits and many do not receive hazardous pay. There is a new bill in California being introduced, SB 227, which presents a safety net for all, a wage replacement during events in which excluded workers, like our essential farm workers, are left without work. Can you speak on that or any other issue or or law regarding wage replacement for farm workers? You know, that, that is very important. When farm workers were deemed essential workers, um, any federal program would not help them because the majority of them are undocumented. 
and that disqualify him immediately. Mm-hmm. Working together with USDA, uh, our sister our organization, the UFW Foundation and the UFW, for the first time we were able to get from the federal level some financial help for farm workers. Mm-hmm. And each farm worker can apply to receive $600. No matter if how many people are in the family, everybody, if they work during the pandemic, would qualify. But the problem is that we have to get to these type of things. Climate change, as we're seeing it right now, it is affecting all of us, but it affects farm workers first. Uh, if it rains, they're there. If there's fire, they're there. But they, they have to be there. If we could get something in California, but we need to, The problem is that because they don't have protections, we have to do, go state by state. And not only takes a lot of time, it is something that many farm workers, they will retire and they will not see the benefit of it. Um, we cannot continue to be treated as second-class citizens. We're not. Mm-hmm. We, we put uh, foot on the table of every single person, and we need to start making decisions that benefit and protect this workforce. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, in regards to labor shortage, we know that this is something that has impacted our the ag- agriculture industry for, for many years now. And... Um, H-2A workers, which are guest workers that come from Mexico and several other countries, uh, have have been increasing throughout the years as well. Recently, there have been talks of decreasing the pay of these H-2A guest workers, which in turn can impact the wages of workers who reside here. Any thoughts on this? And does the, a separate part too, does the UFW foresee um, any plan or have any plans of unionizing guest workers, H-2A workers? Like I said, we have an issue of approaching um, um, H-2A workers because of the control of the employer. I, mm-hmm. uh, the, the, their abuses uh, at, at the domestic level, but these workers are abused even worse. Lowering the, the, the wages of these workers is not acceptable. There is a bill that is being introduced that we're going to fight. We cannot allow that farm workers are getting paid less um, when they work harder and under more, more and more difficult mm-hmm. conditions. So we will fight against a bill like that, and, and we're going to fight against a bill like that. And we don't want, and they don't deserve that the wage to, to be lowered. As it is, many workers, when they come with this, through this visa program, when they get here, if the employer says, you know, I, don't, I can't pay you the minimum wage I'm supposed to pay you, I'm going to pay you three, four dollars less. Mm-hmm. They have to accept it. They are already here. They, they need, they, they need to send money to their family, and they don't even know who to talk to, because they come from different countries. So um, the abuses exist. Like I said, the laws in the books are not the laws in the fields. So yes, we would love to organize and unionize these workers. Great. Thank you very much. All right. So as we all know, it's Women History Month. And so um, congratulations <laughs> to too. all the women. <laughs> <laughs> um, in recognition of Women's History Month and on behalf of Lideres Campesinas, a farm worker and women-led organization, I want to especially thank you for being that inspiration and example to all women and girls. Your role as the first female president of the largest and most recognized farm worker union is a remarkable and well-deserved achievement. Uh, many women helped pave that path alongside Cesar Chavez, such as Dolores Huerta, Ellen Chavez, and hundreds of other advocates and farm worker leaders. Can you tell us what or who inspired you and led you to be where you are today? And any advice to those who have a desire to defend the rights of farm workers? You know, I grew up, like I said, with a grandmother uh, who was a Zapotec. And that culture, women are very strong, women are very. Um, Independent, you know, mm-hmm. they, 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 they have. There is not the typical culture that we see in many cases in Mexico. So my grandmother inspired me um, to try things that I would have never thought I would try. But I think one of the things that we need to understand and that we all need to learn is that we should not let others define us. You know, they call us illegal. They call us wetbacks. They call us, you know, they, they, they talk about us because we don't speak the language. I, I remember when I was learning English, I wanted to try s- to get rid of my, my accent so badly until one gentleman, an older gentleman, said, don't. 
When you have an accent, that means that you speak at least two languages. And that is what we need to be proud of. We need to understand that other names that people are giving us don't define us. Don't let our young ch children, women, um, l allow those words to stop them, to hold them back, to not let them grow. I think that is very important. We define ourselves. We don't care what other people say about us. Nice. Very true. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to go to the, the last question that I have, and then I'm going to go to questions from the audience. Um, com it's coming up to be uh, Cesar Chavez's birthday on March 31st, which is also recognized as a day of service and community learning. Um, if you would, if if you would make one wish for Cesar Chavez, what do you think that wish would be? And in addition, uh, what are some forms of service and learning you would recommend? We, you know, he wanted to have farm workers respected for who they are, for what they do, um, paid with with dignity, treated with dignity. And I think that's that's what the, the work what we're continuing to do because unfortunately we have not been able to to reach that. Um, I I think sometimes we assume that somebody else is going to do the work, that somebody else is going to be in and and be an activist, uh, talk to children who need it, talk to farm workers who might need some help. We cannot leave it to anybody else. We need to be the ones to take the action. We need to be the ones to take the first step. And I'm, I'm talking about everybody yeah. because um, if we ex expect somebody else to do it, it's never going to get done. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so I'm going to go to some of the questions from the audience. I'm going to pick a, a couple of them. Let's see here. How can farmers of color from different immigrant communities work together? Is racial justice important in, in understanding farm workers' struggles? Yes. And, and you know, that's what I said earlier. Uh, through history, uh, farm workers have come from different places. And uh, the growers were very good at um, putting us against each other. We have the same... As long as we are being oppressed, we are. We need to be together to fight for our rights. Um, if we allow other ones to pin us against each other, then they're winning. And that is what is happening in our country right now. We can't allow that. Definitely. Thank you, Teresa. Let's see. How can we identify and avoid buying food grown by farms that resist union unionization and overtime pay? Talk to your your stores. Ask them where they get their fruits and vegetables from, their meats, their dairy. Ask them who those farms are and ask them if they have a union country. They're going to tell you, I don't know. They know. They know. Don't, don't just accept that answer I don't know it ask why can't you find out why don't you go ahead and ask them how they treat and find out how they treat the workers again we have to be a voice for the workers because being undocumented keeps them quiet yeah very true okay I'm sorry <laughs> let's see what increased dangers face farm workers as a result of climate change. What opportunity could this mean for building broader support for farm workers among those worried about fires, floods, etc.? Farm workers are at the front of climate change. When the temperatures are very high, you're going to see very farm workers there. When it's raining, you're going to see farm workers there. When there's a fire, you're going to see farm workers there. I think we need to understand and accept to begin with that there is climate change. If we just keep looking the other way, nothing is going to get done. Um, farm workers, and one of the things that we do, we listen to farm workers to see what it is that they want us to do. In most of people, in most areas, everybody has a voice at the table except farm workers. Growers with USDA, with the federal government, have a, a seat at the table, but not farm workers. And sometimes we assumed that we know what is important to them, but we don't ask them. 
I don't think a, a person should be wor working when the fires and the air uh, quality is so bad they can barely breathe. I don't see that why farm workers should be working when it's raining. When in, in their videos, if you go to our webpage, the farm workers are underwater up to their knees and they're working. Nobody else in our country is expected to do that. So we need to stop that and we need to understand what climate change, I'm not an expert at climate change, but we need to understand what needs to be done yeah. to protect these men and women. Definitely. Well, this is a good follow-up, clever question here um, to what you were speaking about. How different would pay and working conditions be if farm workers were white, male, and all documented? <laughs> I think we all know the answer to that. <laughs> they, they would be paid very well. They would not be working when it's raining, when there's a fire during, uh, during the pandemic. The difference would be immense. The fact that our, our workforce is mostly undocumented, it's why people take, it, take advantage of our workers. But if they're white men and documented, they could get anything they want. Mm -hmm. I believe that to be true. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, we know AB 2183 passed, and that was a, a great uh, logro, right, achievement. And so um, how can we support more farm workers now to become unionized and or support union workers winning good contracts? You know, many workers, um, probably a big majority of workers don't even know that we marched in California. If you think about it, they live in rural communities. Uh, they work long hours. They don't have time to watch TV and listen to the news and understand what this bill does. But sharing with, if you live in a farm worker community, share with them that this is not an easy way to vote for union representation. It's a safe way to vote for union representation. When a worker loses his job or her job because they're organizing, now they can get their job back and the employer would be fined for doing things like that. But farm workers need to understand what this bill is giving them. Mm -hmm. And we need to talk to them, we need to spread the word, we need, we need to help them understand. Fear is something that is not easy to, to control, but help them understand what the protections they're gonna have right now. And again, as a consumer, if you demand that the, the, the stores that you buy from are uh, buying from growers who are either to me, under the union contract is the only way we can certify that workers are not being abused. I think if we start demanding as consumers um, that, it would, it would be very helpful uh, for the future of farm workers. Thank you. And um, speaking also off of that question, um, I know that the, the organization ALAS, which is in Half Moon Bay, mm -hmm. Ayudando a Latinos a Soñar, um, have been tending to many of the you know, filling gaps, right, in inequities, addressing those, um, especially in relation to mental health. Uh, I know that there was a mention of really wanting UFW presence there. As we know, those under a union contract are, are, have all the protections that have been mentioned, right, and uh, overall have a, a better livelihood. Um, is there any way to, if there is a rural community where there isn't as much UFW presence to work with community-based organizations? Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. We were we went uh, to try to talk to these workers. Alas is an organization mm -hmm. that has the trust of these workers. So we went with them trying to help them uh, ans answer their questions, see what their needs were. But even then, they had a hard time speaking with us because they don't know us, they were afraid. Mm -hmm. Uh, many of these workers are willing and ready to go back under the, to work under the same conditions because they need it. So yes, uh, working with uh, organizations that uh, want to protect the, the the life, the work, the well-being of farm workers is it's definitely something that we we need to do. Yeah, great. Thank you. Okay, you spoke about Maria Isabel being 17 years old and dying due to harsh conditions. Is the UFW looking into organizing uh, to build political momentum for the push of the CARE Act to pass? You know, the, the farm worker, the, the UFW has been working for 62 years in trying to get these helpful farm workers. When Maria Isabel died, we marched again. We, we 
we fought, we we demonstrated until we we were able to protect these workers. Um, the 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 work that needs to be done it's uphill, and uh, we're not gonna we're we're gonna have to continue fighting the fight, and having people like you who understand and want to support workers, it is gonna be able to make a difference in any legislation that we can get passed, okay. including the Fair Act. Okay, thank you. Okay, and this is an online question. Do other unions treat you with respect? Me, personally? Yes, yes. I so. very <laughs> much so, very much so. Yeah. I don't know, I do believe that it is because, like I said in my comments, uh, I stand on the shoulders of others. And I think the respect comes first for the, the work that we have done for 62 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, just that I represent that institution it is. It comes together. So yes, I, 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 on the. I mean, on top of that, unions have told me that they believe that if it wasn't because of the UFW, the labor movement would not exist as it is right now. Yes. Thank you, Teresa. Is there any way you know to connect the consumer to the reality of the farm worker? In other words, create a link between worker product and user you know we have in our social media um, a lot of videos that you would always see that farm workers are sharing their working conditions and the majority of these workers are not um, don't have a union contract we have in our the UFW website a list of companies mm -hmm. under contract so if you go to those uh, mushrooms we're talking about mushrooms if you go to these big stores, to Albertsons, to any store that you buy from, ask them if they work from this farm. Ask them if they, they I'm sorry, if they buy from this farm or if they buy from Monterey Mushrooms. And if they don't buy from Monterey Mushrooms, why not? They, this is the company that gives the workers the, the benefits and the pay and the respect that everybody deserves. So why not? We need to, like I said, as, 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 as consumers be more vocal, and um, if, like I said, join our social media and you will see all these uh, videos and, and comments from workers about how yeah. bad they have it. And the UFW was also a part of the implementation of the Equitable Food Initiative? Yes, right? that is yeah. correct. That is an organization that we started and that has impacted workers, um, about 30,000 workers uh, in the United States and Mexico mm -hmm. and Guatemala. Um, right. by, by coming together and giving, the key of it is giving the workers a voice. Yes. And not assume that, the, you know, the, the employers for the most part understand and assume that they know what the workers need and they have no idea. Great. Thank you. And I have uh, one last question from the audience. And you sort of touched on this as well, but how can members of the general public support better conditions for farm workers? speak up via their voice donate to the ufw the work that we do we we survive you have no idea how many great people donate to the ufw but we survive um by from this the support the the social media or, or some influencers that now I'm, I'm not a social media person <laughs> i don't understand <laughs> it but this is something that everybody is watching now spark speak on your social media about farm workers issues um, talk about why you don't agree with the way they're being treated why you don't agree that the farm workers don't have legalization just because a political party doesn't want to support it all right thank you thank you so much and i know that there's so much to cover right <laughs> so little time but you covered a lot during your, your speech, and thank you for, for having this discussion with us. Thank you very much for having me here. It's really an honor to be here with you, knowing that Caesar started it here 40 years ago. So that is, I really appreciate you inviting me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.